So good morning, April the 25th, 2016. This is CISG 114, Section 1, Web Technology. And my, today is day number 27 in the week number 14, the last week of the semester, and the second last day of all the classes, except for next Tuesday, which is the makeup class day. So let's get started. First of all, welcome back to this important class. <coughs> today we have two speakers from among yourself who would like to take up the slot for the speech of the semester. And they are going to share with us what they have learned throughout the semester in a, at most 10 minutes speech. But before that, I would like to bring your attention to this week number 14, day number 27. And I just released the teacher's message of uh, this week, this morning, and it's considered as the last teacher's message of the semester. Uh, with that teacher's message, I would like to thank you for your hard work throughout the semester. I would like to make sure you understand the philosophy behind the design of learning experience in this particular course. Um, actually, many of you know that uh, because I've already shared many of the points, the rationale, the reasons why we do things that way. Uh, starting from the first day of the class, I introduced to you the idea of a GE course and the differences between a GE course and the major courses. And I just tried to help you understand the philosophy of general education from the University of California. And the purpose of this class is to make sure that you got an experience to try to become your own teacher. Namely, you are invited to transition yourself from a talk to learn student to a learn to learn student in the process of doing that, you experience the lecture, you experience the inquiry based learning, you experience the self regulated learning, as well as the problem based learning from individual work to pair work to teamwork. And most importantly, you learn how to be responsible for picking up ideas from the topics of interest you choose on your own on a weekly basis. And in the first 10 weeks, we invite you to take a topic of your own interest and produce a journal of the topic using the critical thinking method of O, observations, I, interpretations, and A, applications. So, so in order to help you understand this approach, I need to first start by telling you the expected learning outcomes. Uh, although it is not in this semester was strictly followed this time, but it's very important that as a teacher I also spell on the learning objective, that's the teacher's expectations of what can be achieved in the course of this learning. And the learners outcome, which includes six in this particular course, um, and the first one and the last one are actually built into the first and the last learning contract. And I invite you to understand the motivations of why we set down this learning objectives as well as learning out outcomes um, because these are work that has to be done by you and you need to learn how to provide them uh, feedback, uh, evaluations of the work to do. So we start out your work by giving you something called rubrics to start with about uh, the assessment uh, you can basically make on your own before you submit your work because you can check and balance it. <clears throat> so uh, it's very important to keep the needs of the students in mind and meet the learning needs, not just in this course, but how we can build up in each one of you some academic ability which will be benefit, uh, benefit to your subsequent semesters of study. And that is the importance of the general education course providing you not just the content of the course, but the process skill of getting yourself engaged in the content of the course. So if you notice that I show them, uh, teach you anything in detail in the context of the knowledge domain, but I give you concept, I give you resources, I give you a plan to make yourself your own teacher each week using the blended learning approach, the before class, during class, after class, and end of the week activity. So concentrating on the key concept rather than the details, making the fundamental point clear, why you need to carry out some learning activity as expected, the weekly journal, the discussion forum, the blog, okay? So we hope that with this training in mind and 
process that we've gone through, we do have some experience, experience which is based on some experience of doing of something. Okay? And we introduce to you the idea of questioning into the topic of interest. We introduce to you the idea of setting goals for your actual study. We introduce to you the idea of setting a timeline, the idea of evaluating the progress, and the idea of revisions of the steps. Well, finally, we also introduce to you the, um, uh, the implicit power of teamwork, how you can complement one another in your team. So these are very important things. But when you study the videos and the resources provided, you will also experience some conflicting ideas. Now, why people will say it this way and why people will also say it the other way. So we introduced to you the very first article is web technology making your life better and how do you come up with your own answer, all right? So some people will say yes, some people will say no. Even in the context of your learning culture on the free presentations, as you can see from our Genifice team, e-learning can help us to learn better. E-learning makes it learning difficult because it's an immersive kind of learning sometimes. So how do you balance between those comforting ideas? So how is it taught? It's basically, we hope you become your own teacher. We we'll hope to learn how to make the best use of time, uh, not just crash your time together to produce a homework artifact one or two days before it's due. Uh, that is something very important. Of course, we need to motivate you to learn the topic of your interests. So we invite you to select a topic after evaluations of some resources. Uh, we hope that with that accountability building as some as a student, you do not procrastinate. And remember, uh, we call the learning lessons in information literacy when we introduce to you the idea of project information literacy. We also introduce to you the factor of frustrations due to procrastinations and due to lack of strategy to handle a piece of assignment, which is often not secondary school line, which is often inquiry based. And not only speaking, that is a research assignment. Not only in a research assignment, you need to get us some facts based on the topic of interest. You need to pose some uh, arguments of your own. You need to support your personal view by stating some example. And you also need to listen to your partners, your team members, ideas, and present your own uh, positions. Uh, remember, when we invite you to select a topic for your learning contract number three, from the four of you, uh, each one of you has already got your individual proposal, we invite you to present your own team, your idea listens to your team member's idea, and eliminate one topic at a time, and when you're down to three or two topics, we invite you to concentrate on the pros and the cons of the idea you select. So sometimes, how do you motivate yourself to make team member to do it? We try to give you the experience of going through this process. And the process of voting out a proposal sounds to be very interesting. And, well, I understand that some of your team did not go through this process. You just say, oh, we got a, we got a topic. And those are like all team members. Our team understood that this is a topic we'd like to work on. And it turns out that, as you report in your presentations, Normally, you discover that um, you, you, you require some extra time to harmonize the differences between what another's idea when you just first accept the topic at the front end. Uh, because you've never gone through the discussions, and so you need to go through the discussion again to come up with the set of three or four questions of interest to look into the topic. So as a teacher, we need to be very uh, patient in order to walk you through the process. And so, uh, basically, if you look at the teacher's presentation of today, I've given you the ideas on how I plan this lesson's teaching learning, and what has been taught, how it has been taught, and how do I motivate you to go through the process of your work, as well as how do I grow as a teacher. So, in the end, I would like to thank you very much for um, the feedback you provide through Learning Contract Number 1 and the feedback you provide for Learning Contract Number 3. 
uh, this that helped me understand a lot of your anxiety, concerns, and also excitement. Um, finally, according to the school's requirement, you can complete one officer's student feedback questionnaire, which is available in your student web information, and we will spend five to 15 minutes this first day and five to do it in class if you have not done it uh, at your convenience. Okay, so having said that, uh, I would like to bring you back to the feedback, uh, not feedback, the review of the semester of week one. Well, as I, as I said in week one, uh, everything you need to learn, uh, everything you need to do, uh, has already been included in the first week. Uh, at the end of the semester, we need to get back to the first week and click on this button and take a good look at what you should have gone through, all right? Except for learning contract number two, we did not do the artifacts. So it's very important that you go through this table week after week and take a look at the questions you have already selected for your journeys, which is very important for your learning at school in the semester and to reflect them back on the artifacts you have already produced. And of course, this is the very last mileage of your semester. You still have to get to learning before you're done, uh, or, or before May 3rd, next Tuesday. And so you will have the score returned to you on that. Um, and of course, uh, individually, I also want you to remember these set questions for each topic you choose to explore on your own. These these set questions could help you through quite a large number of talks in different courses because this is based on what we call the collegiate learning assessment to measure an individual college student's ability to inquire into something. Alright? So and then it's also important for me to bring you back to the learn to learn uh, activity. For the most semester using the brand of learning scale, you know that on each week we have all these links for you. Um, actually, uh, the links um, set up to week 10, and then you'll be one more week on week number 11, and there is no such thing for week number 12, 13, and 14, uh, because basically the same topic. And then, um, this is the reading list, okay? Uh, for the whole semester, we have this uh, actually 10 reading lists together with uh, what extra reading list, all these four reading lists are just the same for the learning portfolio. And after that, uh, it's basically the topics that we uh, invite you to go through uh, individually as a pair and also as a team. And at the end, we have all the links of the support website, and all of these will become a very important resource for you. Uh, it will be actually be on for uh, at least one or two weeks after the end of the semester so that you can point your material back to your Mahara. So having said this, uh, let's get back to the speech of the semesters not. Uh, today we have two speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Peter, right? So uh, have you uploaded your PowerPoint yet? Uh, right yet? So are you going to use your computer now? Make sure you have a connector. All right, so, but at the end of that, you need to upload your PowerPoint here. Okay. That is a very important. So I give you your time now, your 10 minutes time. So our first speaker is Peter, the second is Isu. All right, so thank you very much. Please speak into the microphone. I think you need this one. Thank you. Yes. 
we can see something now. Looks very nice. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> hey, hello, everyone. Uh, this is my speech of semester. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, uh, my name is Zhang Hua, and you can call me Peter. I'm a year two student from faculty of all social sciences, and I come from Pyre 9 and Team 2. And now I will share with you some, something I have learned in this class. Uh, first of all, is what I have learned in Rain Contract 1. Uh, in the country one, my partner Tom and I choose two different topics. Uh, I choose what is information privacy, and Tom choose what is information technology. And in this current contract, I know the both of these two concepts. Information privacy is a privacy of personal information and usually relates to personal data stored on computer systems. Mainly includes individuals' name, signature, address, telephone number, date of birth, medical records, bank account details, uh, and contemporary or opinion about a person. As I learned in a TV program, Dr. Wong has uh, showed us in the class. Uh, nowadays, there are many kinds of IT based scams. Uh, the criminals who violate information privacy are cheated more and more victims. Which shows the idea of information privacy is truly a numerous concept and waiting for one theory. When it comes to information technology, it is mainly used for information management and uh, processing of the various techniques in general. It is mainly the application of computer science and communication technology to design development, installation, uh, implementation of information systems and software applications. Uh, in Clearing Contract 1, I have learned something about how to avoid being scammed. In my opinion, as frequent users of the internet, we should enhance our confidentiality, consciousness, we post our personal information on the web. First of all, we must be careful to post our private information on SNS. And secondly, only create multiple online accounts and fill payment information online as little as possible. And last but not least, do not leave any high return investment such as the emails, including the actual link or phone call says you will be private. Uh, after learning contract one, uh, I finished learning contract three with my teammates. Uh, our topic is how to combine. Uh, sorry, uh, our topic is the how people communication through photo sharing. Uh, my teammates and I choose four different topics. Uh, first one is what is law, and second one is what is photo sharing. Uh, and my topic is what is photo solving. And the last one is what is podcasting. Okay, now let me share something about what I heard. Uh, the first one is the blog. Uh, a blog is a discussion of informational set published on the internet. Blogs are used to share information and the content of the blog inside. It is generated by the users and creators of the blogs. Blogging as an information sharing platform emerged. 1990s and become instantly popular because it was easy to use and didn't require the most computer skills to use. Blogs nowadays are highly interactive. The readers of the blogs are allowed to comment and even message each other. Because of this, blogging is often seen as a form of social networking. And photo sharing is simply the publishing and transfer of digital, film, uh, digital photos online. 
in photo sharing websites, there are several services which are uploading posting managing and sharing of photos. It is designed to facilitate the upload and display of images. So examples, uh, so it resembles an online photo gallery that is set up by individual users. Uh, when we come to my topic, what is Foxonomy? Uh, I have something to say about uh, Foxonomy is a new basic concept, but it is not a theory. Uh, it is first introduced by a photo sharing website called Flickr. Uh, so, which means uh, Foxonomy have a uh, few connections between photo sharing websites.
knowledge base on commodity to be traded for economic prosperity. In a knowledge that society individuals, communities, and organizations produce knowledge, knowledge intensive work as a symbol of knowledge, as a symbol of knowledge, the raising of more and more open source code soft software style and mobile apps are creating more chances for all the people in the world to you know, innovate based on their own ideas. In a knowledge society, users instead of professional developers will be the main part of development and innovation. And Wiki is a website which allows collaborative modification of its content and structure directly from its web browser. In other words, Wiki is an internet platform that provides open editorial rights of its content on content to visitors. Users can add, remove, or edit the content as their wish or under some kinds of situation. The concept of Wiki was first processed by Howard Cunningham in 1994. He established a website allowing users to create some some knowledge is they want to add to the websites. And that's uh, what, uh, what I have learned this semester. Uh, I have um, I must to um, express my deep uh, my deep appreciation to Dr. Wang and my teammates Joanna, Romina and Tom. Uh, thanks to they have helped me a lot and taught me a lot of knowledge in this semester. That's all thank you. Thank you, thank you, Peter, for making us very speak of the semester. It's a very interesting uh, account of your work. Ethan, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, I need to make sure that that goes back to the PC.
think this uh, this activity is uh, very uh, improved my confidence to present in class. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan, giving us a very soft but up to the form speech of the semester. Uh, having gone through a uh, few speakers uh, sharing with us the learning in the semester, let's see if I could, uh, yes, let's get back here. Uh, let me pull the trigger. <laughs> let's pull the trigger back to week number, I think it's week number two. Yes, let's go back to week number two during the class. <coughs> Yes, it's very important. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Okay. Yes. Let's, let's try this one first. Okay. Yes, because of the time limit here. But anyway, let's go directly here. Let's see if we can get something similar. Control. You see that? It's the, the sign is not working properly. But anyway. It's very important. Uh, let me try to give you back to you this on the first day. But I would like to mention the importance of four C's that we mentioned in week number two. Uh, in the process of picking up the four C, which is very important as the best practices for 21st century learning, I want you to keep that in mind. In the semesters of learning, I hope that you understand we start out with writing journal based on selecting a topic of interest. And the writing of journal, as Eason has mentioned, follows a specific approach of OIA. The OIA approach helps to question into something, okay? It helps to question into something. And it is important that you remember this question into something is related to the first C, okay? The first C is called critical thinking. OIA is one way to get you through practical thinking exercise is give you some time to manage a topic, to think about a topic based on the data gathered, and to give you time to come up with questions. And after thinking and questioning or something, they give you time to extract your lessons learned. So the first thing you need to remember for the best practice of the 21st, 21st century learning is practical thinking, the first thing. Well, the second activity you proceed in the doing, after doing a journal, is to share your journal with your learning partner. And the, the part involves a lot of sharing, exchanges, and that is the second C. The second C in the 21st century learning is communications. Communications of your ideas to your very relevant person, so partner, your learning <coughs> partner, to your teammate. So critical thinking is the first C, Communication is the second C. Why do you need to communicate with your learning partner as well as your teammate? Because you need that help to help you improve the way you think about something, to help you improve the way you solve a problem. And these kind of help extend them to you because you need it. It's something the third C is all about. The third C is called collaborations. Some people are saying it's cooperations, but Actually, it's collaborations. The difference between cooperations and collaboration is normally in cooperations, each one of the team member is going to have a separate task, purely completed by the team member himself or herself. But when you do collaborations, it's one single task, jointly finished by more than one person. So you need the help of your partner, you need the help of your teammate. That is collaborations. That's the third C. So the first one is to start out with critical thinking about something. The second C is you communicate what you learned after your critical thinking to someone else. And the third C is to collaborate with someone to help you complete a part, a problem, or a task. Now, what is the final C? Okay. That you have like to show your documentary today to make sure you have a good impressions of the final C. But unfortunately, oh good, we come back to this uh, minutes ago, we cannot do it. I want to let you find out what the final C is all about by giving you a little bit of 
this. And I hope you did it on your own already. If not, just before the end of the semester, let's Technology it. is on the rise. Just give it a chance how convinced. far it will go. If my goggles don't deceive me, that's you sitting across from me. Ah. I'm David Pope, and on this episode of Nova Science Now, oh wow, I'm peering into the future to find out he walks. if robots can learn how to walk, will they become our constant companions? My dream is to have robots living with us in our home. Could wearable robots give us superhuman strength? I can actually put my weight on the structure while you're wearing it. Oh, oh, and eat on the wheel. And transform our lives. No boundary between a person and a robot. Yeah. The world is starting to change. And. My oh, eye! I can control this thing with my mind! Is it possible for a machine to read your mind? I am a superpower! And reveal your innermost secrets? The computer is correct! What if all of our thoughts were public? Lying will go away. It's sort of like a mental nudist colony. Where is all this heating us? Oh! Domino bots! I'm exploring the good. So now you can walk? That's mind blowing. The bad. Not every advance is progress. Not every new thing is better for us humanly. And the not so pretty side of technology. All to find out. Whoa, that's scary. What will the future be like? And you gave me a dirty look. Up next on Nova Science Now. Number two, he needs a sense of balance. 
As you shift your weight from one foot to the other, your inner ear is able to sense the change in your position and keep you from falling. Darwin gets this ability from a sensor in the circuit board. These two small things, these are the balance sensor, so it knows its orientation and direction. Okay. Ah, so, that seems more to fit right here. You're good at this, you've done this before. Thousands of times. Okay. Even if Darwin can see and balance, he still can't move without muscles and joints. Number three, your muscles are your body's engine. You can't move without them. Darwin moves with the help of actuators. For each moving joint, we have one of these actuators. So it's basically an electric motor. A motor that converts electrical energy into motion. And that gives Darwin the ability to move. All right. Hey, we have As for his sense of touch, he gets it from these four little sensors on the bottom of his feet. Hours later, I'm finally finished. Tell me that's the last step. Uh, you're almost done. <laughs> now you need to attach the arm to the rest of the body. And that's the last step. <laughs> Hello, I'm Darwin. It's <laughs> adorable. I can already feel him seeking world domination and wishing his screws were done better. Even though my robot's fully loaded, he can't walk yet because he still needs a brain. And that's where roboticist Dan Lee comes in. The first thing we're going to show you is how the robot uses its vestibular sense, which is its sense of balance. Vestibular from the word vestibule, which is one of the things in our ears. Exactly, inside your inner ear. And so without using its vestibular sense, what would happen if you push the robot? All right. It just will fall over oh. and then get back up. Oh, wow. That's, that's cool right <laughs> So, go ahead. Exactly. Wow. So now what we've done is we trained this robot using something called reinforcement learning. So exactly what you just did, we kept pushing the robot over and over, and it was now able to figure out that every time it fell down, it was kind of a form of punishment. When Darwin falls, his software gets an electronic signal that basically says, this is bad. After being bullied around hundreds of times, he finally learns it's better to do this. Or, oh no! Reps are so they can learn from this angle and this angle and this hard and this hard and this hard. Exactly. Uh, Dan's even teaching his robots to learn through imitation. We will, we will crack you. This camera detects my body's movement and sends that information to Darwin's software, which quickly translates it into a copycat movement of his own. You'd think with all this sophisticated software, Darwin would be able to keep up with me. Look for it! Oh, I'm so sorry! <laughs> but you can't. Just trying to make a robot walk stable is ridiculously difficult. I won't say impossible, because I don't like that word, but it's a very difficult challenge. Oh, wow, it's so big. Yeah, we are masters at it. Come on, man. Wow. What's so doing here? An engineer, Thurman Lockhart, is trying to figure out why. He's built this strange-looking device to analyze not just how we walk, but how we avoid falling. And I'm about to try it out. But first, I need to suit up. Thurman's outfit is filled with sensors that measure how far, how fast, and in which direction I move. Can't decide if I feel more like a superhero or a Broadway dancer. Well, <laughs> I am going to have to wear a headband as well. This is just an elaborate prank to humiliate me television, isn't it? The little white balls are part of an optical motion capture system that instantly creates a stick figure of me. You can dance in the way Next, I'm put in a harness because it's time to take a stroll through Thurman's obstacle course. That's good. After walking back and forth several times, suddenly. Oh, good. Ow! Did you feel that, Logo? Did I feel it? You made me shake under my feet? <laughs> yeah. But check out what happens when I do this a second time. I handle the jolt much better. My body and brain have already integrated thousands of pieces of information in a flash. Right. That's because we have the exceptional ability to adapt to sudden changes in our environment. Walking is a skill that took millions of years for us to develop. And when you think about it, it still takes each of us about a year to go from floppy, to crawling, to waddling, and finally mustering the skills and courage to walk on our own two feet. 
and we never stop learning how to adapt to the many obstacles we confront every day. So walking is not just more complex than I thought, it's much more complex than I thought. And if you wanted to design a, a robot that could walk as well as a person, I mean, this would be fantastically complicated software. I mean, you know, we have to be doing billions of calculations with every step. It is amazing that we are able to do it almost innately and uh, without really even thinking about it. Dennis Hong hopes that in the future, his robots will be able to master this extraordinary human skill. And they're learning how to do it one kick at a time. Every year, hundreds of teams from around the world compete at RoboCup Soccer, a competition designed to foster research in robotics and artificial intelligence. To make an autonomous soccer playing robot, you really need to solve all the grand challenges, the really different problems in robotics. Robot vision, autonomous behavior, bike walking and running in the future. All of these needs to be solved to truly build a soccer playing robot. But what comes naturally to us comes a lot harder for Dennis's robots. Domino bots! Think you're pretty good at soccer? I'm better, I can do this. <laughs> Whoa, that scared me. He got right back up. And he gave me a dirty look. <laughs> Despite his robot's shortcomings, Dennis is optimistic. By the year 2050, we want to have these type of full-size autonomous robots play soccer against the human World Cup champions and win. You're going to have robots playing humans? Do you expect them to win? Yeah. Uh, uh, 20 bucks. Here you go. 20 bucks. There you go. While this may sound like a sci-fi fantasy, many experts believe that humanoid robots can progress a lot faster than we think. Sophisticated robots are already building our cars. Pretty soon, they could be serving us drinks and even doing the laundry. In Japan, where the aging population is growing faster than in any other country, Researchers are developing robots to care for the elderly, from bathing them to moving them. And one day, they may even babysit our kids, a job that has always required a human touch. Sherry Turkle, a researcher at MIT who's written several books about the effects of technology on humans, is concerned about our future relationship with robots. It's too easy to look at them and say, oh, they're not there yet. They're, well, they will get to something very powerful that we will want to hang out with. And then you have to say, well, where will we have gotten to? Why is that something that we want to develop? And in the future, robots won't just be taking care of our kids. They may become a part of us, literally merging with the human body and transforming both of us into something in between. Wow. At Exobionics, they're developing a robot that could restore our ability to walk. This is our exoskeleton. So you can see it's a robot that can walk and move without somebody in it. <laughs> and this one's designed for paraplegics to get them up and walking again. People like Amanda Boxtel. <laughs> You're breaking a few speed limits there. In her 20s, Amanda was injured in a skiing accident. I lost all sensation and movement from my pelvis down. There's nothing. So crutches, no good. But in the future, that could change with the help of a wearable robot. Wow, is that standing you up? Um, yeah, I couldn't do that on my own. Wow, that's mind blowing. So now you can stand and you can walk. Yes. This I gotta see. Let's do it. <laughs> the exoskeleton is intelligent enough that it senses my center of gravity and also when I shift my weight over to a foot, then it triggers another step. So Amanda shifts her body like you or I would to take a step and sensors pick up that intent. That sends a message to this onboard computer, which tells the exoskeleton it's time to take another step. Right now, the exoskeleton works only on flat surfaces, but one day, these researchers hope Amanda will be able to use it anywhere, even walking upstairs. And they aren't just helping people like Amanda. They may help average Joes like me with this. So David, here we have the Hulk exoskeleton. It's like a... The Hulk is designed to help people carry heavy loads, and it would come in really handy if you happen to be a firefighter. How much weight do these guys have to load? All right, hands, 10 pounds, okay? Boots, 
Takes out to the old Jack here, so they're eight pounds. Yeah. Alright. Breathing apparatus. Very yeah. Whoa! You can't fight a fire without hoses. Oh, jeez! That's 50 pounds of hoses. I've got 100 pounds of equipment on me. Is it heavy? Is it heavy? It's 100 pounds! Your buddy's up on the third floor of the building, you're going to need no, some. No, 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 some no, 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 Carrying 130 pounds and it's just to put a fire in. That's right. Wow. Alright, so you've made a point. This is unbearable. And here's where the Hulk comes and in. And the structure actually surrounds your body. The idea is to take all the weight and put it all the way down to the ground. Wow. Completely bypassing you. All the weight that you put on that external skeleton actually bypasses the user that's inside and taking that weight to the ground. So they don't actually feel the weight that they're carrying. Not only that, the Hulk is also designed to increase your strength. Now what I'm going to do is turn it on. Now you can actually feel a little bit of power. Oh, I see. It's picking itself it's up. It's picking now. itself up. And so this is going to be my thigh, and when my thigh moves, that triggers it to start pumping. Right. I guess this is at our very lowest setting. Turn the highest setting and see what happens. I'll try that. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I put on the Hulk and get loaded up again. Ready for those? Is, yeah. This is what killed me before. Go ahead and put on the hoses, Dave. These are different hoses. Same hose. That's amazing. I, I feel nothing. It's like you might as well put it on the roof of my house. Yeah. It doesn't affect me. That's the idea. I can actually put my weight on the structure while you're wearing it. Oh, oh, and you don't God. feel it. That's amazing. So all the way it bypasses you, comes down that torso, down these titanium legs, all the way into the ground, so you actually don't feel that weight. All right. Now should I try walking? Yeah, please. Try. <laughs> it takes some getting used to. It. There are fractions of a second where I suddenly feel really heavy. And then the robot says, oh, here I can help you out. And then it takes a little bit. Uh, yeah. Wow. Don't worry, man. I'll save you. That's what I'm here for, man. Give me your hand. David Boom is backtracked. <laughs> The boundary between a person and an animal robots is already starting to change. Lots of people have mechanical hips, um, and then people have electronic interfaces to their, their cochlea. We are going to merge with our machines more and more. We're already merged with our machines. In the future, will wearable robots like this give almost anyone a leg up? You know, no one looking at us would ever know that you're a paraplegic and I'm a skinny nerd. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to imagine just how much robots may change our world. Thoughts. 
but his 14 electrodes do pick up patterns of electrical activity coming from my brain, my brain waves. Brain cells communicate with each other by firing off tiny chemical and electrical signals. And whenever I think something like disappear, a particular pattern of brain waves is generated. The headset picks that up. So as the neurons inside your brain fire up, the signal gets weaker and weaker as it travels through and then gets projected onto the surface of the scalp. Oh, wow. So it's okay. very, very faint. So they're not thoughts. It's not mind reading. It's like the echo of neural activity deep in my brain. That's right. Even though it's just an echo, the signal is good enough for the computer to recognize a simple brain pattern once it learns it, like lift. And voila! It's reading my mind. Can you imagine? I mean, in some future world where everything is hooked up to this, I could just make anything happen just by wishing it. Or at least that's what I was hoping. Until Tom Lee tells me this headset can easily be confused. In other words, wrong. If you were wearing this all day long, um, there I can imagine instances when you might have a brain pattern that's very similar to when you were thinking about disappear, and it may trigger that same action. You mean things might happen when I'm not wishing them to? <laughs> That's right. surface of the scalp is bound to be imperfect, because what it hears is a mere echo of my brain cells firing. But what if we could tap directly into the brain? That's what they're attempting here at Brown University. Kathy Hutchinson is paralyzed from a stroke, but she's controlling a robotic arm with much more precision than any headset would allow, thanks to sensors that have been implanted directly onto the surface of her brain. Kathy made headlines when she played a crucial role in a groundbreaking mind-reading experiment. She simply thought about reaching out to pick up a cup of coffee. The sensors in her brain picked up electrical impulses, and a computer turned them into commands, controlling the robotic arm. It's an astonishing breakthrough for brain science that offers hope for the paralyzed. I went to see John Donahue, one of the heads of the Brain Gate team at Brown to find out how they turn mind into motion. This is a model, right? No, this is a real human oh. brain with its spinal cord attached. Come on! This is an adult brain. This is, you know, it's the right size to fit inside your head. John's been working toward a machine that can tap into our brains for more than 20 years. The problem is really quite immense. We had to know where the brain signals are, but we've known that. If you fall back a little distance behind the middle of the brain and you run into this little bump, this is the marker for the arm, this little twist, and that little twist is the place, the gross anatomical landmark for where your arm is actually controlled. So every time you move your arm, first, this one little spot on the brain says go, and sends signals to a particular set of muscles, and then the arm moves. The next problem is that you get that signal, and we need to have a sensor. We need to have something that can pick those signals up. So we've developed this microelectrode array, which is extremely tiny. The size of a baby aspirin, the microelectrode with 100 tiny probes was implanted on the spot in Kathy's brain that controls the arm. Still, turning the signals into clear instructions for the robot wasn't easy. So this seems to be the arm. This is the one that I saw in the, in the video of Kathy Hutchinson controlling it with her brain. Yeah, that's right. This is one of the uh, two arms that she was using. Wow, and so how does it work exactly? Well, uh, let me give it a try. Okay. To demonstrate how incredibly complex the brain's control of movement really is, neuroscientist Lee Hochberg asked me to try to move this robot arm with a joystick. All right. Oh, the white robot. All right. Oh, right here. It would be so much easier if I only had a brain. Stop! Stop! It's taking over. It's not present. So it takes practice. Yeah. It takes some practice. So if such simple commands are difficult, imagine how hard it would be to actually read complex thoughts. 
Could a machine ever do what the amazing Preskin used to claim to do on his classic 1970s TV show? His birthday fall on March the 6th? Yes. Thank you very much. I hear that this could be the mechanical Preskin. And it's not a magic trick. It's a nine-ton MRI at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Psychologist Marcel Just and computer scientist Tom Mitchell use the MRI to peer directly into the brain as it works. Hi, David. How you doing? Good. In the study, you're going to see labeled pictures of objects. While I ponder the objects projected onto a screen, the scanner isn't reading brain waves or electricity. Instead, it's measuring the flow of oxygen-rich blood in my brain to detect exactly which parts are active when I think about different objects. Okay, great job, David. We'll come and get you in one second. When you think of something, your brain activates in those places that um, correspond to your interactions with it. Like if I think of, you know, skyscraper, is there an area of the brain for skyscraper pictures? If you think of skyscraper, you actually think of many things. You might think of very tall things. You might think of the material. You might think of going inside of it. What we'll see in the brain is the whole collage and put together becomes the signature for skyscraper. The team has already identified the areas in the brain that activate for shelter, for food, and for holding something in your hand. It's not like a dictionary definition. It's kind of an experience definition. By studying my brain scans, can their mind-reading computer guess what I was thinking? So I saw 20 pictures flashed before me, and on each one, I thought about it, imagined it, envisioned it. So how do we know if the computer knew what I was thinking? The computer is going to take pairs of those words. The mind-reading computer is given a pair of my brain scans. One when I was thinking of a grape, the other of a cave. But which is which? If the shelter area of my brain lights up, the computer guesses I was thinking cave. Since the other scan shows activity in the food and handling areas, it guesses that a grape was on my mind. And was it right? The computer is correct. Number one. Picking between two words, the computer's chances are 50-50. But can you keep it up? Two for two. some experts on the future concerned. Whenever you're starting to talk about the integrity of the body, the integrity... Well, I hope you'll be captivated by this documentary. Uh, this is the very first one you should see, and as bad as it used to have seen in week number two. Okay? Now, let me try to point out the four C's that I'd like you to remember uh, at the end of this semester. The first one is critical thinking. You practice practical thinking through the OIA. You practice communications through the learning pathway through the online discussion forum. That is the second C. And you practice collaborations in learning country of the through teamwork. So you understand the first C is practical thinking. The second C is communications. The third C is collaborations. Now, when I show you this documentary, up to this point, you should have some idea of what the fall scene is all about. Uh, the fall scene is also very important in problem solving in any occasion of our life. And in my day, let me just give you the scene is creative. You have to be very much creative in order to accept the challenges posed up here. Um, I really give you um, this time first be another episode of Future Technology, which you should have seen in the third or fourth week. But up to now, I think it's good enough. And hopefully, you carry this 4C with you in your subsequent semester of study, and you become a successful academic, uh, academically as a college student. Now, finally, allow me to take attendance for the day, uh, which is the second last day of the semester, except for the makeup class day next Tuesday. Okay? 
Day number 27, uh, Candy, you're here, Neil, you're here, Annie, you're here, Jishun, you're here, uh, Tom, you're here, Connie, you're here, Mark is not here, uh, Jerry, you're here, Tammy is here, Francis is here, and then Joanna is here, Peter is here, Romina is here, Jennifer is here, uh, Sheila is here, Nari is not here today, Carrie is here, and then Alex is here, Ethan is here. Thank you very much for coming back to this day of the 27th of the semester CIS 114 section 1, where technology and life, one final class this first day, and then one makeup class next Tuesday. See you then, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, same yeah. time next Tuesday. Yes, same friends, same time, same time. Yeah. Hope that you will continue watching that documentary at home. It's just accessible in the second week during the class. Okay, thank you very much for coming back. Yes. See you, bye bye.